I unfortunately used it intravenously the first time. You know, it was I was 16 years old. It was a close group of my friends. We were all buddies. We started out smoking weed and stuff like that. The two of the guys, they started getting into the harder things, I believe, because they were getting it from their parents. Methadone pills and stuff like that. And then they started using heroin themselves. I'm not sure where he was getting it from to begin with. But I know when I was started using it with him, he was getting it from Baltimore. And we were kids. We were kids. He had his damn learner's permit. But he was driving to Baltimore and buying heroin. And he would come back and he would just distribute it, you know, throughout his friends. And unfortunately, I was one of his friends. Welcome back. And today, Dana shares his story with heroin addiction. Now, Dana started heroin when he was 16 years old with intravenous use. Now, this choice shaped his life for the next few years in active addiction. He even tells us a story about when he was in jail and attempted to end his own life because he felt like it just wasn't worth it anymore. This is a very open and honest conversation. Um, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, do all those things, man. It really helps this small channel grow. And I hope you enjoy this episode of Chopping It Up. Dana, what's up? Hey, buddy. Glad you came through, bro. We've been trying to set this up for a couple of days. Man, things are tough sometimes. Yeah, man, we got know. it all worked out. But I'm glad we had the chance to chill the other day, you know what I mean? Get to know each other a little bit before we started doing this. Yes, sir. So, uh, yeah, introduce yourself, man. Tell us a little about you, why you wanted to come through. Well, my name's Dana Ketchum, and I'm uh, 37 years old. I've lived around the Winchester area my whole life. Um, it's... It's been a it's been a, a good place to live for the most part of it. You know, it's a nice little town. You know, it's not a big city feel, but you know, it's it's got the big city drugs here. It does, unfortunately. It does, you know, and it's ruined a lot of people's lives in these small communities. But I'm from Winchester, and All right, it's because we're so close to what Baltimore is, where most of the dope comes from, yeah, right? Baltimore, close to these cities. Yep. All right. All those places. So uh, let's start with like how long you've been clean, man. What did you like using? Well, I've been clean for probably close to 10 years now. Um, my drug of choice was heroin. Um, any Actually, any, anything that had an opioid in it. Um, but I really, I really like the heroin the best, more than the pills. And, you know, it just, it just did the job for me. It was cheaper. It was cheaper, very much so. Yeah. Easier to get than pills at one time. It was. Yeah, it probably is now, but there's not even heroin around anymore. Like, everything's fentanyl now, right? Like, everybody that is switched over from heroin to fentanyl mm-hmm. is taking a huge risk. Yes, that's what it seems to be. I mean, I have been out of the game for such a long time. I I wouldn't even know what fentanyl looks like. Right. Back when I was getting high, you know, the fentanyl that I, I used fentanyl before, but it was prescription fentanyl. Mm-hmm. It came out of the patches, mm-hmm. you know, and... More regulated, though. Absolutely. You kind of knew what you were getting, you know, but today, I, I mean, I wouldn't... I would be just like, you know, uh, a non-user rolling mm-hmm. up to somebody, you mm-hmm. know, and they would have something, and I wouldn't know what the, what the hell it even right. is, you know, after I used for all those years. Right. I mean, it's it's a scary thing. It, it is. It really is. So using heroin, how did you start using heroin? Like, how did that come about? How did you use it? Was you snorting or? No, I, I unfortunately um, used it intravenously the first time, the first time I used it, and, you know, it was, I was 16 years old. It was a close group of my friends, and, you know, it was four of us, and, we were we were all buddies you know we started out smoking weed and stuff like that but a couple the two of the guys they started getting into the harder things i believe because they were getting it from their parents okay the methadone pills and stuff like that and then they started using heroin themselves i'm not sure where he was getting it from to begin with but i know when i was started using it with him he was getting it from baltimore and we were kids we were kids Mm -hmm. he had his damn learner's permit but he was driving to Baltimore and buying heroin, and he would come back, and he would just distribute it, you know, throughout his friends. And unfortunately, I was one of his friends. I was the last one of the one of the four to try it. But after I tried it, it was, you know, it was off to the races, and mm-hmm. I had just suffered, you know, the the. Uh, 
broke up with my girlfriend, you know. It was the first love I ever had. So right. I was a teenager. I was taking that terribly. Yeah, that puppy love heartaches a bitch. Absolutely, man. And, you know, I guess between, you know, my close friends that I was, you know, with all the time using it and me having that hurt that I was trying to mask, you know, it, it was a perfect fit, I hate to say. Right, and at a young age like that too, man, makes it harder because the peer pressure of your friends. Yeah. So did you try not to use? Was you just open to it right away or like? Absolutely not. The first, I would say, 10 times I've seen them use, I would I, I would walk out of the room. I was completely scared of needles, you know, uh -huh. and we're kids. We were 16 years old and they didn't start out by snorting it. They injected the first time they used also. They injected. Wow. I mean, it... It's a quick progression, right? Very, very quick. Like, and you know, you don't, you don't even realize that it's gotten a hold of you, you know? So do you feel like this guy was like watching his parents shoot up? There was needles around the house. I mean, how did he learn to do that at such a young age? There was, I, I believe that there was, um, you should going on in his home. Um, his father went to the methadone clinic and stuff. Um, and his and his mom, I believe, was an addict at one time okay. also. So if I'm, that stuff's introduced that early, they kind of know more about it. Because, like, I'm blinded by, like, my dad smoked weed and drank, but there was no needles. There was none of that stuff. So I didn't learn that way. I had to learn from outside sources. Same as you. Like, there was people there that did drugs that introduced it to me. It's just kind of weird to think about it when it's that young, right? People that young knowing what's going on with that, watching their family grow up that way. And thinking it's normal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, man, it's destructive. Because then it comes out and it snatches you up. So how long are you using? Like, how long do you use heroin? Well, um, it did not take long for the local cops to figure out who is distributing this shit. Mm -hmm. And because we're children, mm -hmm. we don't know to hide this. This is a serious thing. Like, we kept it in our clique, but the boy would sell to other people outside of our circle. And I believe uh, he went on vacation the time this one time, and he left his drugs with his second buddy. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, the second buddy's parents came up and got into the safe, and they found all this heroin and needles, and they're like, oh, my God, called the cops immediately. So, of course, you know, this kid being 16 years old, and these cops roll in, on on him, you know, he's scared to death. So he rolled right over on Phil. I'm sorry, I shouldn't put his name out. That's right, but, I bleep that out. You know, they, he rolled right over on him. So they go right to his house, you know, go right in his room, get all his shit out of his safe. Well, they take him to jail. Well, anyway, you know, me and Phil was tight. And you still know. underage at this point, too, right? No one's Absolutely. 18? No, no one is 18. We're probably 17 at this time. Okay. You know, and they took him to jail. Well, needless to say, you know, that day that they took him to jail, you know, I'm looking for him, and I finally catch up with the other boy, and he's like, yeah, all this and that happened, and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know, he's he's in jail, so when he gets out the next day, the first person's house that he comes to is my house. Okay. So he came over, and he picked me up, and we went to his house, and they, uh, I guess they were watching his house, because as soon as we left, we went to the end of the street, and uh, a cop was coming straight towards us, and we went went by him, and he spun around on us, and we took off, and needless to say, threw the drugs out the window, and the you know the cops came and arrested him again because he didn't have a license or nothing, you know. But he went to jail, and after that, you know, it was it was really no more heroin around to be found okay. so if you were going to use you know you were doing pills or something like that you know and and by the way my my sorry addict ass went back and picked up the dope off the side of the road after he went to jail after he oh, went to jail the cops were st still down the street they were i could see them i could see them i could see them and i went down and Around the if corner, you knew it was there. You weren't gonna leave it there. No, and no I was, I was sick, man. Yeah. And it was thirty caps. That's I, what I was gonna say. So when he comes out of jail, he how long was he in jail? He went to jail for two years. Oh, so when he come out after two years is when he picks you up. 
No, no, no. Oh, he so went I'm to, talking about when he got out on bond, though, because yeah, he, he went was, in for the original it was arrest. A, it, was and, a, it was like the next day. Okay, so he, he had was to getting see, sick, though. Yes, he had to see the judge that morning, and they let him out on bond. So it was probably 10 or 11 in the morning when he came right. through so to my house. Right, so he's sick, and he's coming to pick you up, and you're sick, too. Yeah. And yep. then you go back to the same house they found everything in the safe in? He had another 30 caps stashed somewhere else. Gotcha, so that's where y'all went to pick that up. And we went to pick Man, that up. So y'all go to pick that up, and then now you're like, we're going to get high, you're feeling good because you did you shoot up immediately oh, sorry well what happened was is that i had money and they took all his money they confiscated it so i was buying caps from him we were going to ride to the city he was going to re-up with some of the money that i was paying him you know it was kind of kind of a right, deal like right. that so you know we didn't even have a chance to get high before we left his house right. we were going back to my house because everything was so hot but we didn't even have a chance Boom, like, cops get him. You go back and pick up the dope. Where do you go from there? I'm sure you go get high, right? Oh, absolutely. I went, well, this is kind of, this is kind of a, a crazy thing. So the cops pull us over, and the, the chief of police of Stephen City, we had fl flown by his house in a high-speed chase. Okay. Well, anyway, he knew my mother. So, of course, him being nosy, he came around the corner from his home to see where they had to stop that, who it was, and blah, blah, blah. Right, what's happening in my neighborhood. Absolutely. So anyway, um, he looks over to other cops, and he's like, is he in possession of anything? And they're like, no. He's like, you want to search him good? Because if he doesn't have anything, I'm going to go home and take him home. So the cop literally tried to take me home, which was a ways, like a ways away. And I convinced that cop down the street to let me out of the car. Like, this is how brazen I was. I mean, like, it was... Don't take me too far from the dope. Let me out of the car so I can go back there and get that dope. Yes. That was what's on your mind, right? Yes. All it right. wasn't, you know, I might go to jail. It was poor, poor buddy of mine, you know. He's going to go back to jail. He's not going to mm -hmm. get out. Like, it, it none but, of that. But priority. It priority was, was dope, bro. It was me. Yeah. Man, it's, Why do you think that is, though? It, it, it hijacks your brain, man. It does. That's the first thing that that shit does to you is it hijacks your way of thinking, and it manipulates you into thinking that you need it. You got to have it. You're not you without it. And you got to have it before you go anywhere. You got to have it before you do anything. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's a strong thing, isn't it? Like, it's scary. It's so hard to get away from sometimes. It is, and it was so easy, you know. I mean, to look back at it now, it was so easy to start, but it was so hard to stop. Yeah. Like. Yeah, for sure. Definitely easy to get it and easy to get addicted, but hard to break that addiction. But it does take your soul out, doesn't it? Change your character completely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Makes you a whole nother person. It makes you into the person that that you would look at and say, Man, what the you're you're not you're not a you're not a good man. Right. You're not you're not a good man. Piece That's of the shit. best way I could put it. A piece of shit. Piece of shit. It's a piece of shit, piece man. Of straight shit. up. Piece of shit. Um it's how it makes you feel. And then once you start doing the the cruddy things to your family and friends, that's where the piece mm -hmm. of shit really comes in. Then. Absolutely. Not a good man is the beginning. But once you start hurting people, stealing from people, that's Absolutely. where the piece of shit comes in. You have to learn to get disgusted with that, right? Absolutely, man. You gotta you gotta learn to, you know, to want something for other people and yourself to mm -hmm. not be so selfish all the time and worry about you, 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 you know. I, so when you got out of addiction too, you know, before we move on, do you feel like you stayed selfish? Do you feel like that's something you had to learn because you were in this I, selfish box for a while? Absolutely. Right. 100%. Like since, since I got clean, I got out of jail, you know, I, I got married and stuff, you know, and just having having stability in your life, you know, it helps you want to stay in that groove kind of, you know, where you're doing good and right. you feel good and Right, you find your you find your little niche. Absolutely, you know, and when somebody, you know, when you fuck up for that many years, man, and you're actually doing good and somebody comes up and pats you on the back and tells you, Man, you're you're doing good, you know, that shit hits different. It man. does. It, it means different. something too, doesn't it? To have some support, man, because we, we did addiction with no support except for our buddies that wanted to get high with us. Absolutely. And they just yeah. wanted us to support their habit. 
helps them support their habit. It wasn't any kind of any kind of real support. You know, you no. help, you know, you help me, and I'll help you. You know, we'll 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 get drugs off of each other. You know, yeah. You can't I get had I had day, get high you know? friends. I had friends. It's the only time I hooked up with them. Like we didn't talk for the whole month. I got my script. We would spend two or three days getting absolutely destroyed and yeah. not see each other for another twenty some odd days. Yeah. And then that's a, that's another thing, you know, why I had such a, a hard time of breaking away from addiction is, you know, uh, my family was literally doctor shoppers. Okay. Let's talk about that. So mom, dad, both in your life, how's not, everything coming not, up as a child? Like when you start young? Well, you're... you know, with, I, I always lived with my mother, you know, she was always, you know, there for me and my grandmother. So, you know. Basically, we I, I took my first pain pill when I was 16, or probably 15, I had a bicycle wreck. Mm -hmm. I broke my collarbone, okay. you know, and that's when I first knew that my mom was taking pills. And, like, she was just, it was, she wasn't into, you know, like Oxycontins or anything. It was just the lure tabs right. and stuff at the time, you know, so I didn't really, you know think my mom was hooked on pills you know i just thought that that was something that you know we kind of you know did every once in a while when you know i got my prescription i didn't realize that my mom was hooked on pills so later on as the time goes on you know my mom has these pills you know all the time and we're you know we start you know obviously you know when we're going out together she gives me a couple pain pills you know and it's, it's, Let's have a little fun. Let's catch a little buzz, not realizing how long that's going to take. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, after, of course, you take those Lord tabs for a while, you start seeking for, mm -hmm. you know, the harder pills. And, you know, when we get into the harder pills is when, you know, you start making money also with them. So then you really start trying to go out, you know, and my mom and grandmother would go to the doctor and they would literally come back and say, here, I need you to sell these for me, you know? And I would have hundreds, hundreds of pills, Dilaudid 8s, you know, Oxy 80s, you know, whatever was hot at the time. How many are you using a day? Like, what's your, what's your habit look like at this point? Oh, man, when I was, when I was using pills, I couldn't even, I couldn't even, you know, catch an auto off pills. I'm doing, you know, six, probably six Dilaudid 8s at a time. And I had to sell the lotus to go get heroin because it's just not cutting it for me. Mm -hmm. Wasn't getting high enough. You know, like it's it was pitiful the amount of narcotics that I could put into my hundred and twenty five pound body without dying and not die. I agree with that. Like, they're the same, man. It's like you. Sometimes I tell the story of how many I've done, and they're like, you, you don't even believe it. No, but it gets that way after four or five years. It, it gets where you're doing insane amounts, and it's not. You know, it's not that I'm doing the six. In the day, throughout a day, I'm doing six of them every two hours, mm -hmm. every three hours. As soon as I think I can catch another rush off those Delatas, I'm at it again. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when you got a handful like that that don't cost you that much. Are they expecting a certain amount of money from you every single time that you have to fulfill? Or Get, you know, so some after after a while, when they you know called on, because at first you know I didn't really tell them how significant. That they were what they were worth. Absolutely, gotcha. it was when they started seeing all the traffic come to the house. Uh -huh. They're like, "You're making way more money than what you're telling." And me being greedy, of you know what I mean? And addicted to where you're taking. Absol you're, absolutely, ninety percent of the money is going in your arm, right? Yep, absolutely. You know, so, but it it was always, you know, they were happy with what I gave them because they didn't have anything. You know, yeah. my, my grandmother always worked. My mother, my mother, not so much. Before she got real heavy into the pills and stuff, um, she ran like uh, private duty nursing homes and things like that. And she always did real good with it, man. But like those, the, the pills just, they, they, so they started the, down So you the think it like uh, the Vicodin and stuff was more controllable and once the oxys and a lot of it got in it got out of control or? Well, was it just all together out no, of control? It's, from it, it's, it's all together out of control, but you know, the, the lore tabs didn't do it anymore. Right. You know, that was something that you took when you didn't have anything to inject in your arm. And even then it just hurt your stomach because you took so many. Absolutely. You know, it's so you're literally stuck in this vicious cycle. You know, you've got all these pills being thrown at you all the time, you know, 
and it just so do you ever get called selling do you ever get any charges for that i got a a possession um of a controlled substance in 2009 and uh a possession with intent to distribute uh, imitation controlled substance mm -hmm. and i got nine nine months in jail for that and uh did a diversion program uh for part of those nine months and it came back out and the first day that i got out we left white post diversion center and my uncle lived right down in fucking white post and while i was in the fucking in jail of course he's got all these pills and we leave right from the fucking diversion center and go straight to his house. And the first thing he does when I walk through the door, chuck, 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 right in my face. You want some of this. Right in my face, man. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have time to breathe. He had the needles in his hand and the bottle of pills in the other. Like, I barely made it to go see my probation officer before I got It was Apple Blossom Friday. Like... Mm, you're it, fighting all kind of demons in that bro, moment. Bro, it fucking took over. It took me over immediately. And you know that as soon as you mm -hmm. use, you're going to be going back to jail that you just got mm -hmm. out of. That's mm -hmm. your fear. You're scared mm -hmm. of that. And you know. But that addiction's stronger than that fucking fear is. And you know what's fucked up is, man, is the program that I did when I got out, I was allowed to keep my job. I had employment. I had a pocket full of money. I had, I had just went out and bought myself a motor scooter, so I had transportation. You know, I had all these, all these tools that I could have used to do so much fucking good. But as soon as that fucking bottle of pills got shook in front of my face, that whole time, it just, it just went out the window, man. I went right out in the fucking shed and just... So while you were in, did the diversion teach you anything about addiction, or was it... They did. They had they had some classes, but you know, I I listened to them and stuff. You know, and of course, when you don't have the shit in your face, you're all about you know sober right. living and clean living. You know, but when you have the pills shook in your face, you don't have to walk back in that diversion center every evening and be in fear of taking a urine test. You know, first thing that comes over, it's done overtaking your brain before mm -hmm. you even have a chance to use it because and it's already you, setting that dopamine off. Yep, already. I'm I'm high before I'm high. Mm -hmm. And the thought of it gets you high. Absolutely, you know, and that's I'm already, hard to resist, ain't it? Yep, and I'm already thinking of ways to get around a piss test. Mm -hmm. My first, my mm -hmm. first one, first one. I'm already thinking, and I'm clean. I can go right there and do it but i'm already thinking ways just You're luckily like, can i get high real quick and then go take a piss test yep. type of deal i want to get high now i don't want to wait till after i see my po because it might be a day or two Yep. just luckily i had enough fucking sense and enough strength to go see that po as soon as you man. got done the po straight to the i day blasted day. right in the right in the right in the back seat man right On in the, the way back home seat. Yep. So when you went in, like, this is a pretty vicious habit you had. This is the six-a-day habit, you know what I mean? Or the big habit when you go into jail that you're talking about having all these pills? Yes. Okay, so how was that detox in jail? Like, you're going from however many hundred milligrams a day to nothing, right? I tried to kill myself. Okay. I tried to kill myself. They found me hanging in my room. How long did that take before you did that? Probably about two days. Sitting in that cell by yourself, lonely as hell, yeah. hopeless. I was at it's the not end of my rope, it. man. I was I was literally at the end of my rope, and you know I had just, I had just, just gotten out not too long ago. You know, I had all those all those, you know, tools that you know I was given because DOC did give me the tools that I needed to make it on the outside. They. Got me secured with a job, you know. They got me. They got me a savings account to make sure I had money when I left. That I didn't have to go and you know try to do something grimy to make money to try to try to get by. Mm -hmm. You know, it was me that made the conscious decision to fuck up and to go down that that path that was I know was leading to nowhere. You know, and it just. Again, hijacking the thinking of the brain, man. And that, you know, and that just goes to show you, you know, after I was locked up for all that time, I tried to take my life, you know, 
I got out after that and I did it again, knowing, you know, it's confusing. Isn't it? My brain just like it, it, when they say your brain it takes years for your brain to recover, mm -hmm. it takes years for your brain to recover. It definitely does. It, you kind of feel it when it starts coming back though, because same for me. After a couple years in prison, I was getting sharper, wittier, quicker, remembering things that I never thought I'd remember. But it takes a while. Yep, it sure does. But your body does heal, man. I think that's a good thing about it. You know, there is hope that your body can heal. It is going to come back. Yeah. The biggest part is getting over that fear, isn't it? That fear of not, you know, not feeling that way of 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 how it is to get off of it. Like, is there a suggestion you make for getting off of that withdrawal? You know what I mean? How do you get past that? If you, for me, personally for me, it had to be jail. I couldn't do it no other way. God himself could have came down and looked me dead in my face and said, you got to quit. And I'd have looked at him and shot up my arm. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, 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 for some reason, it just didn't, it didn't register. It didn't matter, you know, but the longer that you go without using substances, you know, your, whatever your drug of choice may be, it's easier for you to decline the offer. If you see it, if you're offered it, you know, for me, it was anyway. I, I'm not, you know, grow away from it. Have absolutely. to grow away from it. I've, I've made the analogy before about the magnets; they suck together, but then when you spin them around, they push. It takes a while for them to spin around, but once they do, it'll actually push you away, instead of drawing you closer. <clears throat> but first of all, you have to change those things. You can't get out of jail and hook up with the guy with the big giant bottle of pills in his pocket, right? No, and that's it's, a major mistake. It's so hard though, because it's your family. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's your family, you know? They they want to see you. They've missed you while you were gone, you know? Yeah, but you have to understand that that just because someone's related to you doesn't mean they're good for you. Absolutely, and it yeah. took me it took me a long time to to realize that, you know, that even though even though they're family, you know, they have to want the good for me too. Right. You know, and and not be selfish and look for money for themselves or, you know, whatever whatever it may be. Yeah, man, that's tough money right there. Uh, so from there, man, like, okay, you get out, and then what do you do to rebuild life once you finally decide to to get straight? Well, this la the last time that I was arrested was, let's see, it was September September 1st, 20, 2016. So you're 2015 or 2016. Okay. And it was for a probation violation, and they gave me— 18 months for and a dirty or for a new charge for for a dirty okay for a dirty and i had i called it driving on suspended or something like that it was 18 months so how many violations did you get before that oh man i was i probably had like 10 okay so you continue to violate because you can't stop using oh absolutely i have violated time after time mm -hmm. after time and see the thing with that diversion time is they give you for every day that you do there you get a day to of day good of good time, time. Mm -hmm. yes. So my goofball ass, you know, thinks in the back of my mind, oh well, I got all this good time, you know, I can get a dirty urn and go to jail, and you know, I I did that a couple times and got out and got right out with the good time. Mm, so the probation violation would say we're going to send you to a month, but you have sixty days good time, so we're just going to take that off. You've already served it. Well, the first time, my first violation that I got. They gave me, it was 90 days. Okay. And I had literally 90 days of good time. So, no, I'm sorry, it was six months of good time. So, I wrote the records lady after I was sentenced, and they came and they let me, they let me write out. No shit. Yeah. Never heard of that before. Yeah, they came, they came and they let me write out. So, you know, you got to get out of jail free card. Yeah. That's what that was. Yeah. Did you think about that while you were using Yes, absolutely. That was my, that was my, that was one of my reasons to, one of my good reasonings to use. Right, why not? I, I got I'm, this good time. I'm going to use that shit. I earned it. I, I get to fucking veto the consequence. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I'll be honest, that time that I went in for those, those uh, two weeks, I had some boxings with me. 
Okay. I took some boxes with me. Right. You know? So, shit, when I got out, I still had seven left. You know <laughs> You know oh. what I mean? Like, I was fucking, it, it, you know. So I, you never even had the chance to. I really to... didn't even do jail that time. Right. You know what I mean? Like, until, the like, the third violation. Because for the second violation, they forgot to even take the good time off. So the second violation, they gave me six fucking months. I thought I was going to be sitting in that motherfucker. Here they come. Call my name. Pack it up. Catch them. Huh. Time to go. I ran, literally ran out of that fucking Sally Port. Oh, shit. Literally ran out of there. Yeah. Like, I thought they done made a mistake. And, <laughs> and they was going to try to come get me again. Right. Like, I I've literally ran happen, home. Though. I've seen that happen. I've seen them let people out they weren't supposed to let out. But, you know, I, I ran home and, you know, I found out my girlfriend had done left and took off with this dude and you know just it was a just a, a bunch of bullshit mm -hmm. you know like immediately when i got arrested dude, the girl fucking couldn't just couldn't wait to, to right do oh dirty, well he's man. gone so on to the next one basically yeah basically yeah okay so this 18 months was the final sentence you go in you have to serve that is that prison time jail time it was it was the first um the first 12 months, first 12 months was at the county jail Okay, out there um, at Winchester. Okay. And then the last six, I went to the Harrisonburg Diversion Center. All right. And it worked the same way as White Post? Or? It, it was basically the same program as White Post. It was, it had, it had a good bit more structure. Okay. There was more classes, you know, there was more accountability at, at Harrisonburg Diversion Center than there was at White Post. But a lot of the same officers worked there. Huh, okay. So... You know, it was kind of the same, but it wasn't. So um, you go through that program and get out, and this is when you're done. You know, I got, I went through that program. I got out, and my granny picked me up at the gate, and that's the last knock on wood. That's the last time I, I ever, uh, I was ever there. So what do you do from there to rebuild life? Like you come home to something, or you have a place to stay. Where do you start? Well. I got out, and um, the good thing about diversion is, is you work there and you save your money. And they make an account for you, and they take a a certain percentage of your check, and they allow you an allowance, and they save the rest. So when you get out, you have five or six thousand dollars. Hopefully, at least that, right? Absolutely, you know, and you have a job because you could keep your job. The place. You know, we'll give you two weeks to get your things, get your life in order before you even come back to work. You know, so made my mind up that when I got out of there, I was going to do things different. While I was there, I made a few friends and there was a guy there that had a, a nice little Mazda 6 car. Um, and he was telling me that he wanted to sell it. Well, I was talking to him about it while I was there. And uh, the guy said, you know, look. I'll make, I'll make you a deal on it, man. If you really want it, I hope you get on your feet. So when I got out, I took my money. I took a portion of my money, and I bought this car. And my grandmother's sister, Mary Jane, let me stay with her at her house in Woodstock because I was working in Harrisonburg at a turkey factory. And I'd literally have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to make my shift at 4.15 at the turkey factory. So... I got out of diversion, bought my little car. I had I had a plan. Mm -hmm. I had a plan. And I I executed my little plan as I went. You know, I kept my job at the diver at the um at the chicken at the at the turkey place and until I found something else, that's where I worked. Well, you know, I continued to go there and do my thing for a few months. Well, my grandmother um, says there's a job opening where she works helping take care of this elderly man. <laughs> so anyway, that's always been a thing of mine too. I've always helped my mother and my grandmother with their businesses. They always took care of elderly people in her home. Mm -hmm. So to go and be able to do this and make some decent money at it at the same time, it was a win-win. I loved old people. You know, I, I do. They're full of so much knowledge and, you know, just wisdom. It's just, I, I love old people. So I'll go down there and I start working for them, and before you know it, I bought myself a, a new car, you know, and got a little place to live, you know, 
with uh, I met I met I'm sorry I'm skipping around I'm I'm terrible mm, with this right, my man. brain jumps You're doing your thing, bro. Um, so I met a I met a girl, you know, and and we got a house, and just everything just seemed to mesh together, you know. I didn't go back to the old places that I went before, the old people that I used to go to and talk to. I didn't bother I didn't bother with any of them. I just I went to work and I came home and the satisfaction that I got out of making a paycheck and them taking taxes out of it and me contributing to society, that felt so good to me because I've always, was always a drag. So it's like, you know, well, wow, it's starting to come to me now, you know, after, after I get my place and stuff, well, Dana, you know, if you keep on doing these things that you're working hard at and you're doing the right things, more things are coming. It's like you're climbing a ladder mm -hmm. for out of this shithole. And like, I'm, um, you know, experiencing things that I've never experienced before, like paying rent on time. You know, I would, I, I lived in motels before. I never paid rent to nobody but a, a front desk person, you know, let alone have something for myself, you know. So, that job goes on for a while. We move from uh, that house to another house. And um, it's, you know, things are going well, you know, over those years. You know, it's things are staying about the same. You know, me and my wife get married and they're just happy, happy living, happy living a good life. Right. You know, and the things that it's bringing with it. And, you know, it just seems like the longer that I, that I, keep doing the right thing the better things that come so just just this last past year i bought my bought my home bought my home right i never in a million years would have thought i bought my own home man but i did it i did it like uh, it, it almost brings tears to my eyes man because like nobody in my family ever owned a fucking thing nothing nothing not a Right, like, and sometimes you ever think about like sitting in that d dark cell or wherever it was, and just being like it's hopeless, and now you can look back and say, oh, "I almost killed myself one time." Look where I'm at today. Absolutely, man. I drive drive new vehicles. I won the championship last year. I raced four wheelers, the thirty thirty plus vet champion. You know, like I just God just keeps blessing me with. An abundance of blessings, man, because I've been doing the right things, man. Mm -hmm. It just seems like all I have to do, I don't, and it's nothing special. You just get to go to fucking work every day. Do the right thing when nobody's looking, you know, and just God blesses you, man. He, he took, he took away from me because I deserve to be taken away from him all those years, you know, and what he blessed me now, man, it's just, it's humbling. It's very humbling. Yeah, and you can't forget that, right? You can't can't forget where you came from. It's you know, true. You have to be able to have something to measure from. Be able, to, you know, I didn't have anything here, and here's where I'm at today. And it is possible to get out of that life. It is possible, man. You just the longer the longer that you go from using, the easier it is, man. It, it makes it hard, too, because you started so young, you didn't even know what life was before you were using. Like, you got to be an adult in a in addiction. Like, your 18th birthday was an addiction. My brain, my brain never, my brain never developed into, into a man until I got into my, my late 30s. My late 30s, these last probably, you know, I'm not even going to say the first two years that I was out. You know, these just last four years, things have just, it's been like a aha moment. You know, it took me probably the first two years to figure out, hey, I'm doing these right things and, and good things keep coming along. Don't get me wrong. Life kicked me in my ass along the way. I had bad days. Everything wasn't fucking apple blossoms and cherries. Believe me. But going back to that addiction ain't the fucking answer, mm -hmm. man. Because that is guarantee. It's, you know, there's there's not a guarantee you know, if you have a bad day today, if you don't use your life's going to be in the shitter tomorrow. But there's a goddamn guarantee that if you have a bad day today and you use today, your life is going down the shitter tomorrow. 
for sure. It's only going to take a certain amount of time, ain't it? That's that's it. That's it. And you might think you you might think you have control of this situation, but you don't have control of the situation at all. The first time that your brain tricks you in to using and gives gives you a reason you're making up reasons to get high you're done mm -hmm. you're done if Once you, you start that ritual yep you don't turn around and walk the fuck away from it right then and there and find something else to do with your time to get your mind out of that gutter that's where you're going to be in the fucking gutter no doubt about it man and it won't take long to get there mm -hmm. it won't coping mechanisms for for things like that isn't it there has to be a trigger that goes off that sends you for the dope man so when that trigger goes off, you have to learn how to not go to the dope, man. There has to be something there to sidetrack you, right? Absolutely. Whether it's the thought of your family, your kids, the horror you went through, the prison cell you don't want to be in, you have to have something there. Um, breaking the habit right there, that if you break that part of it, you don't even get to the use. Um, I've heard stories about people that would put a uh, AA book in their refrigerator because they would open their refrigerator and look for beer and things like that. You know what I mean? Just out of habit, just look in there and be like, oh, and then they see that AA book and it would break that habit. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's a, you know, that's, that's a really good idea for, uh, for alcoholic an alcoholic to do to just remind them, you know, mm -hmm. that that's what I need. That's what I need. I don't need, I don't need the alcohol. I need this book. You know, I need, I need something to keep my mind of course an addict and especially an old addict like myself, you know where it's going. You know as soon as you take that first dose where it's going to because you've been down the road so many times and it all ends in the same places, jails, institutions, or death. Just luckily, I was graced with jails and institutions. Thank God didn't take my life away from me. Very lucky. Yeah, man, I hear that. It's a... Uh... It's one thing to see people dying, and it's one thing to see another person come out of it, man. I love seeing people come out of that life and then being willing to come on here and tell other people how horrible it is. Because it's definitely nothing you want to get into, and if you can learn from the shit that we went through, like, there's got to be things people are going to see in other addicts that they're doing, right? Absolutely. And, and if they can see that and then understand that it's never going to end well. Absolutely. And because I did the same thing too, where I would get out and think, oh, well, it's cool. I can just do this or I'll just take this or, uh, and I tried to draw lines and I couldn't draw those lines. I've drawn lines now that it's just like, you know, no opiates. I can't do an opiate. I can't do Xanax, period. There's lines I draw. I'll smoke some weed. I still smoke cigarettes and drink a beer, but those things don't destroy my life. You have to draw the line of the thing that destroys your life, man. It's not going to, that, those aren't going to take, over control of your thoughts mm -hmm. over it's not going to give you you know i will i will say the alcohol it's it, some people man, it's a trigger i will say for me i've never had a problem with with putting with taking a drink of a beer and putting it down you know my whole family my my father you know my grandmother i wouldn't say i wouldn't say my grandmother was an alcoholic my grandmother liked to drink you know, at 90 some years old, Grady would drink a bottle of wine and just have a good old time, mm -hmm. bust her soul. You know, my father, he's 70s. He still won't give up the drinking. And, it, you know, it's literally killing him. But he's been an alcoholic damn near my whole life, his whole life. You know, and he just, he still, he still doesn't get it. He doesn't drink every day, but he probably drinks about four or four times a week, I would say. And, you know... If he could afford to drink seven days a week, he probably would. It's hmm. just, it's just sad. It's, just, it's, it's, it's very sad, man. The powers of addiction, and you know how how long can have a hold on you. If you right. don't, and I think it's an addicts too. We look at one addiction as better than another, Absolutely. or worse than another. Like we're still judging other addicts from our addiction. I'm learning not to do that. Yes, sir. Because uh, alcohol, just because alcohol don't mess with me like that doesn't mean it's not going to destroy somebody else. Absolutely. And I, you have to understand that, that their struggle might be different than yours, but it's still the same. Absolutely, man. And, you know, maybe even worse because you can't walk into the fucking store on the corner mm -hmm. and get my drugs. Mm -hmm. But you sure, sure can walk in mm -hmm. there and get everything he wants. 
Yeah, man, I've said that several times to alcoholics that I've talked to. It's like, I can't imagine. Just I can't imagine going to the corner store and there being Xanax's heroin and Oxy's right there on tap. Could you imagine? That's I mean, got to be I mean, hard. Seriously, seriously, like I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that'd be like a pharmacy around here letting a, letting us come in and get whatever we mm -hmm. wanted. Like it's over over the counter oxys. Would we ever quit? God. Would we ever quit? Oh, in, in all honesty, I'm at a space in my mind now where I probably would not want to go there because I know that to, even if I could get them every day, it still sucks for me. But if that would have been the way I could have had it, I probably would have never quit. That's like, what I'm talking God, about. Like, like, me. like before we stop using. Right. Like, yeah, absolutely. Would we ever be able to break this cycle? Yeah. I mean, I get. I think that's the type of stuff that these kratom addicts go through. Absolutely. You know I mean? Or this tenactopine, whatever the reds are. That absolutely, I mean, man. I got a friend who's trying to come off the reds now, man. She's been on them for a year, and they're vicious. And it's gas station heroin is what they call it. You buy it right at the friggin' vape shop. You buy it right at the gas station. And it's addictive as heroin. It's just not regulated. I mean, it's, that's it's crazy. That's scary. Man. Yeah, because every time she tried to kick two times, and every time she tries to kick, like, the store's right there calling me, calling yeah. me. And then eventually she just submits, man. I hope she doesn't submit this time. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I hate, I'm not trying to tell her to trade one thing for another, but you know, if she can get on like a, a, a suboxone regimen or something she's like just, that, she's trying. just to break the cycle of going to that mm -hmm. store daily, break the cycle of what you're doing. That's your first, that's your first thing. Mm, AA it's, book in the refrigerator. It's to break that cycle, man. And you know, you can just, it's all about keeping your mind busy, man, and trying to do things mm -hmm. that you know are going to be productive for you if you know you're chasing dope all day long that ain't going to make you a paycheck at work or if you're uh for example taking those to get to work and you're spending 300 dollars of your 700 dollars check a week just to be high while you're at work that seems yep. a little counterproductive as well right absolutely that's how i got for me where i'd make whatever a week but i would spend it all on pills and maybe have a little bit left over so I could get high for the weekend, and then I'd be back to stealing or something to get high the rest of the week. I had this, uh, I, had my, I was always real tight with anybody, anybody that I always bought drugs from, I was always, always real tight with them. So I met this, uh, this gentleman from Baltimore, and him and his wife, they were, they were great people. They were, I mean, they, they might have been drug dealers, but, but they were good people. You know, and this guy gave me a job driving a uke. You know what a uke is? Mm -hmm. A big off-road dump truck. Drove one of them. I made 25 bucks an hour. 25 bucks an hour. And literally, at the end of the week, my whole check would be gone before I would even get it. And it wouldn't be him. He would be telling me, dude, no. Like, no, no. You know, but I'd be like, dude, I can't come to work tomorrow. If I, if, I, if, I, if I don't have nothing to get high on, I can't come to work tomorrow, you know? And literally, I would make six or $700 in a week, and it would all be gone. Before you even got it. It would all be gone, you know? It, it just Showing pitiful. up to work to get high, man. That's it. Just Working just for the buzz. Pitiful. It's pitiful. Yeah, I got no, nothing. <laughs> it definitely gets tough. So, look, I got these questions here. I don't know how many it is. But I'm going to ask each question, and you have the option to pass. All right? So first one here is, uh, how can you describe how heroin made you feel? Like, if you could describe it, when you shot up, how did it make you feel? The first time, it instantly made me sick. First time, it instantly made me sick. The sickness wore off. It was like I was, I was just floating, and nothing could touch me. Like, it didn't, nothing mattered. Nothing mattered. I was right. in a dream world. It was literally a dream world. Heaven. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those first those those first few months of getting high, you know, when you can take a cap and split it with your buddy, you know, after that, man, it's you're just trying to get by. Uh, so what was the lowest point of your addiction? Like lowest point, rock bottom. My lowest point is It's probably when I tried to kill myself over there in the jail that one time. That was, that was, that was a real low point for me. But it still wasn't low enough for me not to get out and use again. 
this this last time I'm thinking what what got me was my the people that I cared about they were getting older in their life and I've been fucking them for so many years I just wanted to make good for all the bad that I've done or at least try and like my grandma man she was my number one god rest her soul she passed away Thanksgiving day three three years ago but uh she was always there for me man and and you know I can I can say I did it for me but I did it I did a lot for her too because you were able to make her proud before she died right absolutely man that means a lot oh yeah for sure um what happened that you regret the most while in your active addiction My mother losing her life and me not being able to 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 help her, you know, and I was kind of contributing, you know, she she didn't overdose or anything, but you know, we were we were using buddies, you know, so I would contribute to her, she would contribute to me, you know, and just one of the worst regrets I ever have in my life, man, is sharing sharing drugs with my mother. Mm. That's that's a fucking the tough pill to swallow, man. Vicious. So while in active addiction, did you ever see someone overdose? Yes. Can you explain anything about that? Yes. Well, yeah, I'll tell you. The guy was overdosing, and, uh, you know, I, I was waking him up. You know, he literally was passing out the back seat, you know, but... Me being a drug addict, I was worried more about stealing the man's fucking dope, saving huh. his fucking life. It's crazy, ain't it? I, 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 and you know, to to think back, like I, I, until you asked me that question, my brain hasn't been back to that moment since that moment. And you know, just I'm smacking the guy in his face, and I'm digging with my right hand and digging in his pocket with my left. You know, just fucking scumbag. This man's mm. dying and you're, you're robbing him. You know, like, fuck. It's... Yeah, but I, I can see that it bothers you, bro. And that's what it's about. It's about healing and it's about being accountable for the shit we did. And I'll, I'll be honest, bro. I never even thought about that until now, man. It's... Some of the shit that I did, man, was not okay. It was not okay. Granted, the man, you know, the man lived and he woke up and everything, but you know. It's where your brain went in that moment that you feel regret about, right? Absolutely, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm ashamed of what I did, you know, but people, people need to hear this because, you know, I, my, my story might help somebody, might maybe not feel so bad about something that they've done and be able to forgive their self, you know, about something that they've done. I, I, it's probably going to take a while. You know, I might even need to call this guy and talk to him. But, right. you know, I just. That's a tough one right there, buddy. Yeah, man, definitely. So what was the worst thing that you saw during your heroin addiction? My mom died on the floor in front of me. Huh. Sheesh. We was uh, we was at the house waiting for the the drug man to call or the, the drug lady to call, and I walked down the street to get a bag of weed, and it was probably three or four blocks away from the house. And mom calls my phone and says, "Hey, she answered the phone. She said, come on, let's go." So as quick as I could get from where I was at to my house, halfway there, an ambu an ambulance and a rescue or ambulance and a fire truck flew by me. And they stopped in front of my house, and I thought it was my grandma, you know. So I take off running, and I go up there, and my, my poor mom is laying there on the floor, and my sister's sitting there. She's probably 12 years old at the time. My grandma's there trying to give her CPR on the floor. You know, they they rip her chest open. They start shocking her, and she's just flatlining, man. It is, 
It's one of the, it's the awfulest thing I've ever seen in my life. God, I can't imagine that with my mom, man. One of the most awfulest things, man. It's tough. Uh, I feel like, uh, yeah, man. So let's get to something a little bit better than that one. If you could speak to someone that right now that's in active addiction, what would you say to them? Break your cycle, man. Just try to break your cycle. You know, you know, you know, if if I can do it, if I can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. I'm no better than you, bro. No better than you. Probably worse. You know? You can do it, man. You you just gotta want it, man. You gotta you gotta stay stay away from the things that you know is gonna drag you down. You know, go, go, go to the Suboxone or the Methadone Clinic. There's no shame in that. But the shame is to lose your life for something that you can try to help yourself, you know, and to try to get yourself back on track, you know. And if you don't have money for it, there's programs that the government pays for it. You know, if, if, if a person especially in this little town that we have right now. If they want help, the help is here. The help is here. They, it took them a long time to get it established, but it is established now, and you can find help. You know, when I was in my active days of addiction, the closest methadone clinic was in Martinsburg. Mm -hmm. I remember. So to try to break the habit and go to the methadone clinic, it was really, really, really hard. You know, you had to be there by 10 o'clock in the morning. Like, it was it was a hard thing to keep on track. But now they we have, have several one in clinics. Town. Yeah, we several have methadone and suboxone clinics yes, around. Absolutely. You can, you know, like I said, if I can do it, you can do it, man. You just got to start. You got to start with not using, man. Sticking that needle in your arm every day or smoking it, or however you're doing it, just to, you know, and you don't even got to break it all the all at one time. Start slowly, man. You know, go there, get your dose in the morning. If you feel like you got to use, man, try to wait till later on in the day to use. Try to control it a little bit instead of you going to the methadone clinic and you're going right back home to do them both together to see how fucked up you can get. You know? It took me a while to get past that, too. When Use I was... the resources correctly, too, right? There you go. Yeah, don't Use just go in resources. there and keep on trying to get them to give you more, give you more, give you more, so you're just high as hell all day. Absolutely. Use it correctly. Try to come off, because the ultimate goal is nothing. Absolutely. That jails are institutions. And yeah, it's, man. It's not a, it's not a lie when they say that to you. All those places suck. Yeah, that's and that's definitely where it goes. That's definitely where it goes. It's cliche as hell, but it's the truth. That's why it's a cliche. Okay, what would you say was the most important lesson you learned while being a heroin addict? Accountability. Accountability. Okay, explain that. I never... When I was using, I didn't think I was, you know, I didn't think... My my addiction held me accountable, like sickness every day, you know, that that type of thing. You mm -hmm. know, like I I suffered because of the things that I was doing to myself. There wasn't nobody doing this shit to me. I was doing it to me for for the longest time. I tried to blame my addiction on this or that and a third. And it was me, me that was doing it. I was going to get these drugs. This shit's my fault. That was, I think, the the toughest thing for me like the it took a while yes because at first you blamed everybody the first 75 oh, yeah. percent of yeah, it my, the last 25 percent, you start realizing it's your choice absolutely man and and it was it was it was all my choice you know i mean even though i had people there that would you know give me money and give me rides and you know basically facilitate my addiction you know it's my fault if i go ask them to take me somewhere it's my fault if I ask them for money. You know, it's this shit's my fault. This is my fault. You know, and there's a choice. 
Yeah, man. You do have a choice to quit, man. So what do you do every day to help you stay clean? Like you're not doing any heroin. You're not doing anything like that. What do you do? Do you do meetings? Do you do therapy? To be honest, I've never been, I've never been a meeting kind of person. You know, I, I will be honest. The meetings that I did attend, I did get, I did get, you know, knowledge and, and compassion from the other people at the meetings. So, you know, if, Anybody want to go to me? Is there a great place to go? It just was. It just wasn't my my deal. My thing with me is that I got high on doing the right things all day long. Like you know, I get up, get up in the morning. You know, get in the shower, drink a cup of coffee. You know, go to work, come home, have dinner, sit with my wife, watch TV. Mm-hmm. That's what was rewarding to me. My fucking life wasn't a mess. Like it, just just normal normalcy was right. the best the best thing. The total opposite of what you lived before became a buzz for you. Yes, because I never experienced that before. You know, I never experienced to have you know a home. That was not only, you know, paid for, but it it belonged to me, you know, and I I, I should stop saying me, but it belongs to me and my wife, mm -hmm. you know. It's 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 our home that we built together. It's 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 our home, you know, and just seeing the things that we've built together, it's just it's it's amazing. I never I never thought that I would that I would have. The things that I do and, you know, people want me to come around, you know, I'm, I'm loved by. Sought after instead of ran from. Absolutely. There you go. I feel that. There you go, man. Yeah, because I know exactly how that feels. You know, you're you're trusted again. Yeah. You know, you're, it takes a while to build that, too. Absolutely. That feels good when you build it. Absolutely. When finally those people that, you know, that you know would hide things from you or. Uh, not let you borrow things because they knew what you would do with it. Now they offer them to you. That's a that's a great feeling. Well, they didn't even want you to come to their home. Period. Yeah. Don't even don't even fucking come here. Don't come here because mm -hmm. I'm not fucking watching none of my. I have to keep an eye on my things while you're here. Right. You know, and to and now to have things and to have you know, to to have the thought of me having somebody in my home fucking family member are not stealing from me and me continue to let them do that to me and be generous to them dude kudos to my, to God, my family that's man. The truth. to my granny dude my granny was my granny was my ace man she came and fucking picked me up running from the cops more times than one like hmm. a granny granny was a good one man yeah, uh, it's hard to find those people that keep on putting up with you too, huh? And then when you get done, they're still around. Like, because they, they know, they know that that's not you. That's not you, bro. They know that's not you, and yeah. they know that you're gonna make it through it, man. Yeah, yeah, they got faith in you, right? They got faith in you. So this is one of my favorites. If you could go back to one specific time and advise your younger self, would you? And if so, when would it be? What would you say? Absolutely. I would I would tell myself to like is there a specific day where when would you go to is there one day would, you could say here's where I started doing this and everything went shit from there Absolutely I would go back to that day that I was in my room that you know my three friends were sitting there getting high in front of me and they asked me if I wanted some and I and I turned my head and I stuck my I stuck my arm out and I turned my head away If I could take that back I absolutely would because I, I would have taken back so much pain that I caused so many people. You know, I'm not even gonna say myself because you know I, I matter, but you know it's the people that I hurt that matter the most, man. Because I hurt them and they still fucking stuck by me, dude. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I could have been that good-hearted of a person. Yeah, I don't think I could. You know, because I'm a real motherfucker, man. Like, and I'll be honest, like, <laughs> that's another thing that's been hard to overcome, man, is, is, you know, 
putting yourself in another man's shoes. That is one of the biggest things that I've had that I've had to to learn since I've since I've been sober. That's one of the major things about treatment is learning to be objective. Because we're so selfish. Absolutely. And arrogant. So we have to learn humility and we have to learn objectivity. How is what I'm doing affecting someone else? And then eventually you learn empathy, which is what you feel right now. Didn't even know what that word meant. I didn't know what humility meant. I didn't know what empathy meant until I went to treatment. The man in like you know, to sit and have these aha moments, man, with with people that are having aha moments with you. Like, you know, a lot of times, man, that's where meetings work for people. You know, because you get in there and you get around people that are, you know, on the same page as you. But a lot of times, you know, that's where you find your people that are trying to use too. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's you walk a very fine you line. You go to the zombie line. You know what I mean? I mean, the methadone and suboxone is great. But I feel like sometimes when I've seen the methadone people out there, I feel like that's more of a using community than what I've seen at the Suboxone Clinic. Absolutely. And that's just my opinion. It could not mean nothing. It could be total horseshit. I've never gone to a methadone clinic, and I've never gone to a Suboxone Clinic. But there's a certain quality of people, it seems like, sometimes. If that's right, maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, correct me. You know what I'm saying? But I feel like uh, you're either going there to keep using or going there to be clean. And those guys that have to show up every day because they never get a clean urine, they're there to use. Those people that show up once a month or once every two weeks and they get that big take home, those are the those are the people that work in the program. There's a big difference. Absolutely. And you know, that's that's a that's a big reason why people don't want to take suboxone because they're scared. Oh, I want to get high. And I won't be able to get mm-hmm. high. Mm-hmm. You know, because of that, what is it, naltrexone in there? Whatever the it's, chemical is in it, it makes you sick. It's naloxone. It's naloxone. It's, it's naloxone. So and what's buprenorphine. it do to you? It it literally naloxone and buprenorphine. It's a it's an opioid, and then an opioid antagonist. So it's the same thing that they give you if you're overdosing. What the what the suboxone does is it takes and it lays on your opiate receptors in your brain. So if you try to get high, the opioids can't stick to the receptors in your brain. They will not be receptive, and they and, and you will not get high. And that's the idea for the suboxone. And that's, you know, when I was trying to get clean, really, really wanting to get clean, that was the route that I took because I knew if I was taking suboxone that I couldn't get high. And you'd get sick if you did. Throws you into withdrawals if you throw something in your body that's yep. opiate based. Absolutely. Quick sweats, like instant fast, withdrawals. Fast. You feel really it's, bad, really fast. Yep. It's just like it's just like you overdose and then giving you a shot of um, Narcan. Mm-hmm. It's no, um, it's got the same active ingredient. It's Narcan, basically Narcan and buprenorphine. I'm not sure if they're so one way or the other. It's something that kind of hits that receptor enough to satisfy you, but it's something that won't allow you to overdose because it makes you sick when you use. Absolutely, and I will say this about about Suboxone doesn't doesn't lay you out. You know, when I was on methadone, as soon as I would sit down, I would be out. Eyes rolled back in my head. Mm -hmm. Ankle swole up. I mean, all it, that water retention made abs- me fat too. I did it for five years. I gained a lot of weight. It was really fat. Yep. It, Lazy, lethargic. And it just, it doesn't seem that the Suboxone does that to you as bad. And, you know, they can give it to you also at a, a month at a time. So if you are really trying to work a program and you're trying to go to work and you're trying to take care of your children, and you're trying to live your life the right way, you can manage it. You know, if you are doing, if you're doing the right way, you don't have to run to the methadone clinic every day. You don't have to go there every week. You don't have to go every two weeks. You know, if you want to do your program, you can do your program, you can live your life, man. I know know a suboxone clinic right down the road here. It's 300 bucks to get in the door, and then each trip's like 150 bucks. So he writes you 30, 30 a day, or 30, whatever it is, it's 30 days at a time. It's easy to get in. It's not a big deal. You know, right down here, it's a addiction network. It's with John Lindsay. But, yeah, it's it's super easy to get into right there in Valley. 
There you go. So, I mean, that's definitely one of the things that we have around here. Multiple places. Uh, you know, whatever one works for people, right? Absolutely. You know, and it's and everybody's not the same. You know, it's finding it's finding what works for you. But I will say, as an addict, if if you really want to quit, and you can't do it by yourself, I wouldn't go the methadone route. I would definitely try to go the suboxone route, because you'll be able to have a little bit more of a life. You know, you, you, well, even John said, uh, John, that does a suboxone clinic. Uh, somebody asked him one time why he didn't sell methadone. He said, cause you got to have a soul. You can't have a soul and sell methadone. Like that comes from an addiction counselor. I thought that was always weird that he said that, that he's willing to sell suboxones to the community to help them, but he's not willing to sell methadone. That always stood out to me. Like, you know, absolutely. Methadone is a nasty, nasty narcotic. It's a nasty narcotic. Comes out of your bones too, buddy. If you come off of that stuff, it is horrible. Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I went through methadone sickness in jail, and I come off like it was like seventy milligrams, and it was a rough go, brother. Yeah, it's definitely tough. It was a rough. But either go. way, man, if you can decide to fucking find a habit in methadone or suboxone, and you do it long enough to where you don't have the cravings, and then you can start worrying about tapering, absolutely. line tapering. However the hell you want to do it in yep. order to get a normalcy with no drugs in your life. That there is a go. possibility. It's a very big possibility because the longer that you go without using these drugs, the easier it gets, man. Mm -hmm. And that's coming That's coming from somebody that's been through it, that's used the, the same day they walked out of the door to not fucking using, you know, six years later. But you get addicted to certain things, too. You get addicted to snorting. You get addicted to shooting. Yep. You get addicted to the... Routine. The routine, the, routine. the chaos of getting the drugs. Absolutely. Sometimes. So just being able to satisfy your receptors, step away from it so that those routines stop allows you to create another set of habits. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So <clears throat> for the end here, man, we'll wrap up. But uh, what is your message to people? If you had a mission statement, this is Dana's mission statement. What would it be? If I had a mission statement, if I can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it, man. And the help is out there if you want it. That is, you just got to be willing to work for it. That addiction, that addiction that you uh, that you built up for yourself, it didn't come easy, and recovery is not going to come easy neither. So fight uh, as hard to get straight as you fight to get high. You're damn right. Be as good at be as good sober as you were getting high, and you'll shoot for the stars, man. You so, uh, where stuff. can people find you? Like, you got social networks? What's what's your? Um, I've got a Facebook. I got a Facebook. Okay. Um, Dana Catchem. So it's under your uh, name. Same thing. I'm gonna put in the yeah. title. Your name will be in the title, so they yeah. can find you that way. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I'm not. I'm not real big on social media. I have a Facebook and stuff, right. but you know, I'm not an Instagrammer or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, some people might like your story. They may want to reach out, say that you affected something to them. And I know you would like to hear that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, man. I get I get messages all the time about people that are learning from this or this or that has affected them. And those are positive comments. I enjoy every single one of them. So I'm hoping they can send some to you and let you know that, you know what I mean? This is important, bro. I think your story is important. Uh, I appreciate you coming, you know, so... But I appreciate you having me, man. It's yeah, been man. it's been it's been a great time. I I know my, I'm a scatterbrain. My story's all over the place. But it's, it's all good, it's, bro. You know, once you sit here for a while, you get a little bit more comfortable doing it. Sitting in that spot, I've been there, so I know absolutely. how it is. I try to keep y'all on track as best I can. I think you did great. I think you did awesome, John. I appreciate it, buddy. So look, man, like, subscribe, share. Y'all know all the things y'all got to do to help this little channel out, man. I think we need to spread these stories more. If you're still here at the end watching this, and obviously this meant something to you, share the YouTube link, you know, comment in the comments, man. Like it. If you're not subscribed, I don't know what you're waiting for. But uh, thanks to Dana, man. We'll see y'all for the next one.